Jerry, you're scaring the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great. I think that's a great way to embark on this podcast. <laughs> uh, is this so, is this what they mean by podcast? Y- <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna go in hot on that uh, co- comment from Mark here. Okay. Um, welcome everybody, to the Vortex Nation podcast. Jimmy here on the mic. Mark, who just said that fantastic opener. We got Ruben Kitty cornered me across the mm-hmm. table, and perhaps most importantly. We have Mr. Jerry. Oh, Jerry, one thing we wanted to ask, too. Yes. I've heard a lot of people say your last name many different ways. How M- do you say Mitchellark. it? Mitchellark. That's Mitchellark. how I always said it. There you go. You're Hold good. on. You put an R in it. Mitchellark. Wait, no, what? No, no, no. Mitchellark. 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 Okay, Mitchellark. that's what I thought. But I swear I heard... <laughs> it might just be... You, you thought know, Mitchellark? It might just be... It's a on the time of the year. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. The moon phase. You're the moon good. phases changes You're good. the this Louisiana accent a little bit. Micklick. Could be. See, some people say Micklick. I'll answer the most anything. Okay. Especially around supper time, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Give it to me one more time from Jerry the correct way. Mitchell Lark. Okay. There you have it. Bam. That is who we're joined by. Also, now you know how to say his name. And the amount of things that one could speak to Jerry Mitchellick about is staggering. We're going to try and fit it all into a regular length episode here. Um, but perhaps first of all, we should just allow for anybody who's not familiar, uh, to just hear the intro from Jerry himself. Jerry, if you could, uh, yeah, give people an idea of who you are and what you do. Well, I'm a professional shooter now going on, going to be 30 years here shortly. So I started shooting first competition I ever fired in 1976. Just a little, just a little club thing, you know, And, and, and it was in a local dump. (laughs) <laughs> and that's what you, that's where you went out and you shot the local dump. So, and then uh, here I am, you know, uh, being having been sponsored now by Smith and Wesson, going on thirty years. So, wow. So it's been 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 fun. Shot a few million rounds along the way. So a few Good. million, a few, few million, a few that's million. All. Yeah. Now, <laughs> did you <laughs> when you shot your first competition back then? Was that I can't imagine that was just the first time you'd been shooting. How did how did you even get into shooting in the first place? Or was that just kind of a cold cold turkey sort of thing like well i'm just gonna pick this up and go no we always shot you know had bb guns and pellet guns and uh you're always hunting something or the other and uh what was bad about hunting was when the hunting season was over it was quiet mm-hmm. nothing to do you know you go fishing you don't want to drown a worm or something you don't want to be something more exciting than the fishing so i had act- actually met an old boy who had uh was was out of uh i think he was out of arizona and he shot for the what they call the miller combat league hmm that was supposedly predated Jeff Cooper's stuff. Really? So he had a Swenson 45, and he was drawn out of a host of shooting steel targets. And I just thought that was the neatest thing, shooting a piece of steel, hearing it ring. So here I am, shooting steel. Yeah? Still doing it. What was what was <laughs> then your first gun once you got into that? So you said you had BB guns and Pell guns and stuff. And what, what did you first get into as far as like the... Well, we had I had some single action pistols. I mean, revolvers, you know, to shoot uh, shoot with. But then uh, the action game, you needed something a little faster. So I had a, I bought a, a Colt Gold Cup was my first competition pistol. All right. 1976, so. And that is a, that's an auto loader then? Yep. Yeah, it's semi-automatic 45. Okay, like yep. a 1911 style. Yep. Is that the one yep. you just got rebuilt? Yeah, it's a target gun. It was that target gun. It paid $276 for it. I remember it well. <laughs> a lot of money, 1976. <laughs> that's cool to hear, though, because you were just explaining, like Ruben said, you just had it rebuilt. You had, what did you have? You just had, like, a frame and a slide, and you sent it back to Colt or something like yeah, that? Yeah, what, what happened to it along the way that led to this rebuild? Yeah. Well, what happened was I started shooting it, and I, I realized real early on that a, a pistol in South Louisiana, you, you, you make a shot and the brass hits the ground, most of the time you're not standing on ground. You're in the water somewhere. So then okay. you, So you lost your brass. So it's kind of expensive to shoot a pistol. So I said, well, I'm going to shoot this for a while, and it, it was a fad. So I, I got over <laughs> and started shooting revolver. So okay. when you shoot okay. revolver, you always have your brass put in your pocket, go home, shoot 100 rounds, you got 100 brass. You know, Mark, That's- you weren't entirely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Mark uh, thought it was for sinister reasons. But well, see, it's just because he didn't want to get it in the swamp. The that's grass way, in the swamp. Yeah, it's way better than the, uh, the conclusions that I was drawing. So I don't know why it led me to that dark place, but uh, I'm feeling a lot better now. And uh, You see, that's the thing about Louisiana, you're going to be in a cane field or you're going to be standing in a swamp somewhere. So if you shoot a lot, you're going to have to be either one. And a lot of time we're in the water shooting, you know, 
shooting out of a P-Rog or a boat or something, and you, have, you, you lose your brass with a pistol. So a revolver just made more sense. Mm-hmm. What were you shooting out of a boat? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer. Targets of opportunity. A lot. Well, when I was young, it was still legal to shoot a garfish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. You, you cool. could take it with any 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 device you wanted. So, a lot of snakes, a lot of garfish. Huh. So. Now that's interesting, Mark, because we had this conversation mm-hmm. a while back shooting fish, mm-hmm. and you said you thought it would be almost impossible. Whereas I said I thought it would be it would be very possible, and in fact. In fact, if you wanted to put a season on it, I remember saying that maybe if you put some sort of primitive weapons thing on it. Remember the <laughs> smoke pole fishing using your muzzle? Yeah, I remember fish? that one. Yeah, I shot my uh, I shot a lot of fish underwater with a twenty two rifle. No kidding, huh? Yeah, I, I had I've got one rifle. I think I shot it underwater more than I did on top. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. very. <laughs> I don't think I was saying it was impossible because we we're talking about that one season where there still is. It's like a very. It's almost. I think it goes up for debate every now and again. But it was like a rifle season it's for in Pike, like New Hampshire. Or yeah, it's like in that. Maine or something. Yeah, somewhere way up northeast. Um, wow, but that's 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 pretty neat. And so uh, yeah, so you you had this fad anyway. You got the you got the Colt uh, Gold Cup rebuilt recently. Yep, so yep. it came back looking just like new. It looked like factory new. So Colt did a good job. Excellent. And what's uh, Jerry Mitchell's first competition pistol worth rebuilt? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Man, more than two hundred seventy six dollars. I'd say so. I'd say it's appreciated uh, at and, least and, a little. And thirty nine cents. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> What uh back before they invented taxes. That's yeah, well I wish. <laughs> when, when you were when you were shooting competitions back then, what what did it look like at that point in time versus now you're still shooting competition? What what are the some of the biggest things that have changed? That blows my mind, I guess, trying to put that all together. The high capacity guns. Yeah. Back when I started a, a Browning high power was high capacity, 14 rounds or 15 rounds, 9 millimeter. But nobody had the big guns, the, the 2011, the double stack. Right. For, you know, uh, frame uh, pistols and the optics made made a big change in the, in the game. Hmm. And uh, there's so much equipment now actually tailored toward competition. Back when we, when, when we started shooting, there wasn't anything actually made for competition. It was either... It was just either stock out of the box, or it was a it was for some some kind of military application. So we had to take them and kind of make them fit to what we wanted to do with them. So yeah, were you getting stuff from like Milserp, or were you just getting? Because I'm trying to think, because there was the assault weapons ban in there randomly in in the history 90s. in the 90s, but before yeah. then it was yeah. it was kind of like it is today, where you could just go and you could get something that was like a. Was it AR-15s back there and M-16s? Or yeah, was they, it? Had, they, they had uh, M- the AR-15 was on the shelf. Nobody really shot them. I would think the, probably the most popular military surplus was the old 98 Mausers and the British 303s. You could go into uh, uh, Sears and Roebuck, and they'd have these big trash cans full of rifles, military surplus rifles, they all <laughs> stuck in their muzzle down, and you'd go looking through one, like 15 bucks, you buy your... Buy. I, picked, I, bought a, I bought a snow shovel last year that way, but... <laughs> that's, that's, how all the, that's how all the box stores used to have surplus guns. Just in the trash cans, They huh? had these big metal trash cans, you know, and they, they'd have like 30 guns in there, you'd just pick you one out, and like it was 15, 25, 50 bucks, or whatever it was, and uh, very, very common in the 60s and early 70s to find... You know, surplus yeah. that way. What did you? I long what for did, the day. What were? Uh, <laughs> let's say we could go back in a time machine, and we were giving a podcast now to somebody listening at that point in time, and you were going to give somebody maybe their top tip or maybe top three tips as to what to look for in those trash cans. You know, as to sift through and find that that gem in there. That's what would you one. have? What would you have given somebody the tips to look for? Well, it was interesting. Even even predating that, uh, my father in law was Jim Clark, Senior Clark Custom Guns. He started in 1950 as a gunsmith, mm-hmm. and he told me when he started his gunsmithing business, he wouldn't buy a, a, a government surplus 1911 for 14 bucks. Hmm. It was too much. He might buy them for $11, maybe, <laughs> but 14, he, he, he wouldn't buy them. That is across the line, you know. So to give you an idea how much surplus is, has, you know, you, right, like right now a 1911 like that's worth like 14, 1500 bucks. Right, right. And back then you wouldn't even buy them. 
So you were looking for, were you just looking then for the most inexpensive one to kind of just get you by? or? Well, I always went for what I could find the most ammunition for. Oh, okay. The cheapest. Okay. And, that, and that was the old 98 Mauser. So right. you could get uh, Burdan corrosive ammo pretty cheap, five cents around, four cents around. So Yeah. Hmm. I don't want to bounce around, but I do want to back <laughs> up real quick. What were you doing before you started competitive shooting, and what was that moment when you said, you know what, I might be able to do this for a living? I don't think I ever said that. Just kind of happened. I just uh, just started reading about it and doing it. I, I was reading about Ed McGivern speed shooting a revolver, mm-hmm. and I think that was uh, 70, 71 or 72. He was on the front cover of the, of the NRA magazine. And I was reading about Ed in there, and I'm going, that's pretty trick, man. You can shoot five rounds in half a second. Hmm. So my buddy and I bought a book, Ed McGivens Fast and Fancy Revolver Shooting. So Fast he and I and would fancy. He yes. and I would go out and start shooting on the weekend. We'd cast bullets and go shoot and do all the things Ed McGivens did and uh just had a good time making noise. Yeah. So casting your own bullets. Yeah. Oh yeah. You guys are doing so that's why you're keeping the brass because you're reloading at oh, that yeah, point definitely. too. And were you just doing like a single stage and casting your own? Yeah, how- we had uh, we had we had reloads down to about thirty thirty something cents a box when we started. So we'd go to all the gun shops and buy surplus powder nobody wanted, and just whatever, whatever you get the cheapest, the most of we we would buy. How the heck do you develop a load with a powder that you have no <laughs> idea what it does? Well, a friend of mine was very creative, and in, <laughs> and in, in humid Louisiana too. Like, was yeah. the powder just sitting out and you had to scoop well, we it had, up? Or? Give you an idea of some of the powders we found. We had a Hodgdon Top Mark. We had Hodgdon Gray B, which I never even heard of before. It burned like charcoal, but it would it would shoot. So, but we <laughs> <laughs> we just buy whatever you know surplus we could, or, yeah. or you know stuff that was sat on the shelf. Nobody else wanted. Were you ever shooting, and it would just kind of be like, oh, that was a soft one. Oh, that was a big one. I mean, <laughs> I tried to avoid those situations. <laughs> yeah, but uh, sometimes it happens. But it's usually self induced by bad reloading practice. When did you use up the last of that powder? <laughs> I think I still got some. <laughs> <laughs> I do have some powder manufactured back in the 40s, though, 50s. Oh, man. Still shoot. Mm. Shoot pretty good. I tell you what, on your no YouTube cordite. channel. <laughs> on your YouTube I got channel. Some of that too, you yeah. got cordite? Oh, if you went cool. and shot some of that stuff, I know I'd tune in. You'd have at least one view <laughs> from me. I don't. I mean, I think he's got... I'm looking across the table. I'm seeing all 10 fingers, so I'm glad that's he's amazing. got it down. That is pretty impressive that you've managed to keep all your digits. I've I've been very careful with my reloading. Yeah, that's one thing I've regulated really really intensely. I uh, because it can, it can be so disastrous, mm-hmm. and uh, it's easy to get something screwed up and you daydream and you and you do something wrong, then you got to pay the price. So yeah, so I've, I've been lucky. Luck has a lot to do with it too. That's <laughs> that's good to know, folks. So if you take anything away from this, just find a little bit of luck out there, and you should be. Um, so. When you're shooting competition, now, one thing that I think the world has come to know you quite well for is shooting fast. Hmm. And um, so you were obviously a uh, student of fast and fancy, it right. sounds like. Yep. yep. And uh, so at what point did the competition start having you just kind of turn into, well, how fast can I shoot these things? And, and where'd that go? Because I know, you, I mean, you have, you've done world records, um, I've seen you shoot. I've, I've looked back at some of the some of the pictures or some of the videos where you're shooting stuff where you got a revolver with an optic on it looks like the size of a soda can. I mean, you got all kinds of different things. Where where did all that start to come in? The world record stuff and well, the world record stuff was really uh, an offshoot of competition. Smith hired me out to do competitions, but uh, in the back of my mind, I always wanted to do something a little better. Hmm. Than competition, so the uh, the need for speed kind of drove that that want to do faster and faster, and then try to hit multiple targets with it. Because I always had the mindset: if I could hit one target six times in a second, why can't I hit six targets one time in a second? So why why does this not happen? So mm-hmm. then you start playing the visual games, and then you do start the mechanics of it, and just uh, but shooting is such a visual uh, event. That you really don't understand. You don't understand it until you start bringing it up to speed. Yeah, because a lot of times you, you're seeing what you're not seeing. It's kind of happening subconsciously. Is well, that what you're it, saying? It, uh, there's so much going on that's that's taking place, but you don't know how to catalog it yet. 
Hmm. And what separates an exhibition guy or a competition guy from a guy that a club shooter is, uh, the exhibition guy has to catalog it on the line and then he's going to do it. So you have to know every you have to you have to know every segment of the visual experience, and then you just watch it happen. Because at speed you can't make it happen; you can only watch it. It just it just happens, and you're along for the ride. And, and you're along for the ride, but if you know where to look, it it'll always be there. Huh? Make sense? That, Sounds like magic. I feel like I just <laughs> that was some Yoda stuff right there. Um, wow. What was the first record you broke? Do you remember? I'm trying to think which one that would have been. We actually did three of them three. in one day. Just in all in one. One day. Why not? We, so we said, let's do three records. So <laughs> we're, not, we're not doing anything else today. Three's and what was interesting about those records, I, I had never done one in practice. I never achieved those times in practice. No kidding. Really? So when I went there, yeah. it was like. A little bit of the adrenaline. Help I had there. to do something really quick to impress the crowd or I wasn't going to look good. So had a lot of pressure and it, it went well. So I shot uh, eight rounds in a second. Okay. With a uh, revolver. With their eight shot, the 627 revolver. It just came out. Is that, when you're shooting a revolver that quickly, I'm trying to picture two now because I don't have a ton of revolver experience. Is that like the old cowboy westerns where you're like no, using your second hand? No, it's just hand? strictly double action, one strictly finger. Strictly double action, yeah. one finger. Okay, yeah. got it. Because speed shooting with, with, a, with a single action is actually two hands. Okay, right. So the, the whole, not to say the trick, but the art of single action rapid fire is you hold the trigger back. And, and you fan the hammer. Okay. So guys that are good with it can do five fingers like, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, each finger yeah, fans or, or, the, or the hammer. Or they can do two where they just rack it with the thumb and a little finger and it sounds like one. So, but it takes two hands to do that. Wow. Whereas a double action guy, it's strictly all one finger. How does the barrel So you did double action quickly. eight rounds in it was, under? It, it, was, it was exactly a second, so... So you, you time in you time in actually seven splits. So the way speed shooting works, all speed shooting records is the first shot starts the timer. Okay. So that's number one. So seven shots later, which is eight, was one second. So if you break that down, it's like fourteen hundredths of a second per shot. How does the barrel in a revolver spin around that fast? The cylinder. Yeah, the cylinder. Yeah. You sorry, have to. You have right. to make it. You have to. You you make it go. It'll go a lot faster. Oh, okay. It'll go a lot faster than that. So the, the human element always is waiting on the, on the gun. The gun's waiting on you, I should say. The gun's yeah. waiting on yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That is incredible that that cylinder, though, can even just to, even just to imagine it spinning around that quickly. It, and what's really nice wild. now, they, they actually have titanium cylinders, which are lighter weight, so it takes less oh, so. finger to get them going. Because you stop in that cylinder, and you have to go from a rotational aspect of it from a dead stop yeah. and spinning it through a cycle. Yeah. So the eight shot guns actually spin up quicker because the the stroke isn't as long. Yeah. Okay. As, sure. As, yeah. as a six shot. Yep. And when you uh, make it titanium, it's even easier because of less weight. Okay. Yeah. You got so, a bunch of holes bored in them, and yeah. And then when it's titanium, yeah. it's lighter. So, huh? What? Gosh. I'm trying to because I have because I know I have uh, I've mentioned it before. It's the first gun I ever got. I didn't purchase it myself though, but it is a Smith and Wesson, the 357 Magnum little J frame bodyguard. It's oh, a very yeah. small little gun. Yeah. And I've sat there, you know, of course you do the whole like <laughs> check clear thing and whatnot, but you know, and point in a safe direction. But I've sat there and I've pulled that trigger, that double action. They're heavy. They're way heavy. Yeah, J frames are sprung pretty tight. Okay. Is that is so? Is it different when you get to the larger ones, or is it, it? It can be. What you have to realize this is kind of a this is kind of an unknown or an, or an unappreciated aspect of small revolvers. Uh, smaller guns take a harder a, a, a harder hammer strike to fire hmm. them because when the firing pin hits the cartridge, if the gun is light, the gun starts moving before it fires, so it actually softens the hammer fall. Oh, yeah. Because it, you know? it, it hits it, and so the gun's going Right, gonna... yeah, so it has huh. to have some resistance. So the heavier the gun, the less the less hammer energy you need to fire a specific cartridge. Oh. That's why the little airweight uh, 22 J-frames that are all aluminum, the little 22s, have such a hard hammer fall because the gun weighs like, like maybe 10, 11 ounces. So the gun wants to move before the firing pin can carry the energy to the primer. Wow. So Physics. F- physics. Physics, back to that dreadful topic, <laughs> reality, <laughs> reality it, moment. It blows my mind. <laughs> Who's the other the physics. other guy that did a lot of revolver speed shooting? Um, he had, I, it wasn't Ed McGivern. Bob so Munden. Was, yeah, Bob Munden. Yeah, Bob was a single action guy. Yeah. Yep. Did Did he do that method where he oh, fan yeah. the? Yeah. Multiple, I always watched that, and I always fingers. wondered how he did that. Yeah. 
I can't. Im- so you're I just can't timing Im- that you're bringing her back and timing that it's going to fall forward, and then you're bringing it back again. Yep, you just sweep on through it with each finger. So your thumb's going to sweep that hammer back. It's going to go forward, shoot, index finger, middle uh, finger, ring finger. That's some wild finger. timing. Those guns are, are built for that. They have a really ex- exceptionally heavy-duty cylinder stop because the rotational speed of the cylinder is so fast. It's got to be. It'll beat a stock gun to death. Wow. So if you took a stock revolver like like uh, like these guys were using, you, you know, they would, they would run them in no time. Hmm. So they have to modify them. The hammer spur is a lot higher and a lot lighter pull. Yeah. So you can almost flip it, huh. flip the hammer back and fire it. So it's uh, it's all a, it's all a finely tuned uh, experience, you know. So amazing, and to make it look good. And that that one that you just discussed, that was one of the three records you broke that day. Yeah, we right? did a we did a reload record. We shot six rounds and then reloaded. Oh, that one's cool. I think that's and, one yeah. I've seen on YouTube a ton of times. Yeah, that was a two ninety nine. And how does twelve rounds? You have you're throwing that moon clip in. Yeah, <laughs> you got to give it some air. <laughs> Jiminy Christmas! Yeah, that how was a, it, that was a good one. How does that work? Is that that's another one of those things I have to imagine where you're just along for the ride and it's all happening in front of you? Or you have to watch it. That uh, we had shot a little bit. It was like 104 that day in Mississippi. Woo. And I was probably I was, 100% humidity. It was terrible. The 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 film crew for Jim Scouting was about to pass out. <laughs> and I was about to pass out. I was sweating because I hadn't done anything good yet. And I hit, I, <laughs> I had hit some threes and some three ones, but I needed a two ninety nine. So if you if you watch the actual record footage of it, you you notice that when I flipped the revolver to to dump the brass, that it actually slipped in my hand a little bit, oh. and it, the gun and I bounced off of my stomach at the same time. That 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 I released the the six rounds and they all went home, and I said myself don't screw this one up <laughs> <laughs> that was the one moment i remember out of that whole day of shooting when that moon clip when that gun slipped and it bounced off and i threw that moon clip and went right in there and i knew that was it that was that was the moment i had to get get with it, finish, finish it. Gonna happen. was was there like a moment in there where you're like i can't believe this is happening that exactly it's exactly <laughs> what i said it's perfect <laughs> Don't screw it up. It reminds me of that uh, part of Starsky and Hutch when he's kind of like uh, got that guy and he's interrogating him and he pretends to put the rounds in his pistol and then it comes out of his sleeve and magically falls back in the cylinder and then the guy's mm. like, anyway, you have to watch it. It's a good movie. Great stuff. As your brother would say, underrated. And Under, I agree. Yeah, big time, big time Starsky and Hutch fan. Yep. Um, wow. How does how do you get the uh, the spent cases out that quickly too do they just fall out is that gun made no you, such no, that you, they just you fall transfer out it to your left hand and you eject them with your thumb okay so, so wait so the, you transfer the whole gun to your oh yeah left? oh yeah uh, i gotta watch this again yeah that's why i had those grips designed the way i have them designed yeah they which were, is no check ring no finger grooves very smooth and mm-hmm. I always when i shot revolver competitively i always put cornstarch on my hands to make them slippery Okay, sure. Well, yeah. you wanted your hands you to be You wanted slippery. them slippery because the thing's empty all the time. Doesn't hold but six rounds. Okay. Hmm. So you're not going to last but a couple of seconds. You've got to find something to do with it. Well, you need, yeah. to, have sli- <laughs> you need to have slippery You need to have slippery hands if you're going to do the magic moon clip reload. Yeah. Well, right. I'll remember that, too. If I ever decide to conceal carry a revolver, I'll just walk around with cornstarch on my hands all <laughs> No, the but, the, so. you, know, with the, you know, a lot of guys, they put a lot of stuff on their guns to make them very tacky and sticky. Oh, the, and the stippling. But the, but the and, thing yeah. about it is if you grab it wrong in a holster, or you waste a band, you got to live with it wrong. Yeah. Okay. If the gun is slippery a little bit, by the time you get it up to the shooting position, you can squirm it in there and get it right where you want it. Huh. So. Uh, do you still do anything like that now today for matches? Yeah. Uh, I, sh- I shoot a pistol now. I shoot three gun. Sure. So. So it, it know, doesn't make a huge difference how the. A pistol is kind of a weird thing to shoot. It's, it's uh it's so boxy that you can't really hold it. Well, a revolver, you can get up on it high, oh, sure. and you can you can you can handle it a lot a lot easier, a lot faster. Hmm. Once you get the hang of it. So <laughs> I'm gonna go home and play with my 640 I'm, Pro Series I'm this, go home this evening. And play with my revolver too, and I'm also gonna tell everybody that uh, Jerry Mitchell says revolvers are better than pistols. Yeah. So first six. Because if it comes from me, nobody will uh, nobody will listen. But the first six are always good. Yeah, out of a revolver. So you got to you got to remember that the first six. You got you got a bad round. Just pull the trigger again. One's coming. 
<laughs> kind of hard to do that with a pistol. You got to live with what's what's in the chamber. So, well, and if it's you, that next round is coming in point one four seconds. It's or something. coming in pretty quick. And if you're excited, it might even be quicker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's two out of three. <laughs> What was numero trace in this? It case? was four targets, two shots on each. Four targets, two so- shots on yeah. each, with a revolver. Does that so was an eight shot revolver then, yep. or was it yep. a reloaded? It was an eight shot. Okay, so it was a one hundred six, I think, or a one hundred three, or something, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Playing around. Were the other ones at a, at one target then? Yes. Each, okay. Yep. yep. Transitioning's got to make things. Do you? What do you enjoy more? Do you enjoy just like ripping them off as fast as possible? Or do you enjoy the transitioning aspect of it? Well, you learn more when you transition. Yeah, but it's it's uh, that's one of that that's that's that viewership thing I was telling you about. You can only stand back and watch it when you're doing multiple targets and you do it right. It's a, it's a very good visual experience. Yeah, to make it all uh, coordinate like you want. Yeah, and d- describe like what you know, you're talking about viewership. I mean, it's, it's almost sounding like somewhat, for lack of a better term, like an out-of-body experience. It's kind of, yeah. Where you're s- just kind of watching things happen. Well, there's different ways to look at a target. A whole lot of different ways to look at a target and a whole, a whole lot of different ways to look at a set of targets. And not, really? And not stare at them. You know, once you stare at it, you know, a target one to, one to moment. A target's job is to make you want to look at it. And once you looked at the target, you're not you're not shooting anymore. You're watching something else. So you have to learn to stay with a with a flat vision and not uh, not interact with the targets visually. Okay, so now that's we gotta, what I was going to say. Now we got to ask uh, how how does one look when they're shooting? So we're mostly talking about at this point, really, probably pistols and revolvers, yeah, right? Yeah, stuff close. Yeah. How how do you? How does this work? That's that part of, of uh, spending a lot of time with your equipment to yeah. where you can understand different visual techniques and uh, what makes the moment happen and what doesn't. Yeah. But, Jerry, everybody knows that what we want is a really good YouTube tip that we can take <laughs> and then don't have to practice a lot, and then I can just go to the range and be really good like you. I mean, so far, really, all that's going to happen is my wife's going to come home and be covered in cornstarch. That's right. <laughs> Pretty normal day I'm for you. Yeah. Look, that I, was going to happen anyway. I know, yeah. the, I, I know the answer's out there. I'm getting sick of people just not giving it to me where it, the, there's got to be some way that I just don't have to practice. That's what I've been searching for all this time. All this time oh. I could have been spending practicing. I'm searching for the, the answer that tells yeah. me I don't need to practice. No, I'm just, of course, kidding. But, yeah. So you got to practice, obviously, a yep, lot. Yep, yep, a lot. And w- what are you looking at? And then, and you said that there's more than one way of looking at it. Do you sometimes use a different way of looking at it? In certain it ways? depends on the accuracy requirement. Okay. You know, every, okay. Every, everything has a visual clue to its execution in a, in, a, in, a, in a competition. So the guys who actually understand competitions well, you look at targets in sets and not as individuals. So when I walk by a target scenario, say here to that wall, mm-hmm. and it's a general size target, I just automatically program 1,800 splits in my brain. So once the gun gets level to the ground, it's going to start firing every 18 hundredths of a second. Oh. So, so I better find a target to put in front of it. And if I don't, I'm going to have a miss. And you say, well, that's really silly to do that. But if you think about it in realistic terms, if I'm coming into a target zone and I haven't started a trigger prep yet or part of the trigger cycle, I'm a half a trigger pull behind. So when you multiply that times three targets, I'm a shot and a half behind the other guy before I even pull my trigger out, pull my gun out the holster and pull the trigger. Whoa. Wow. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Totally. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get it. Do so, you, so you've yeah. shot competition. Every, a everything reason. is cycles. You live in, you live right. in cycles. Right. So uh, the accuracy requirement, if it's a hard shot, you have to slow down a little bit. So you just you program that trigger cycle into your brain, and that's what you execute at that level. And if it's really big targets up up close, you're pretty much just slapping the trigger, getting some getting some lead on the target and running. So you're not going to really stay there that long. You know, 1,600, 1,800 splits. You just start shooting. When you did the share the love drill yeah, back in uh, Vegas a couple yeah. of years ago, yeah. 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 that's a pretty good example of that whole concept, right? It is. You, yeah. That gun was 
you were doing certain shots in the body and the mm-hmm. head, and then over here and then yeah. over here, but the gun was moving the whole time. Now for right, so for those not uh, familiar with the share the love drill, <laughs> this was actually not with a revolver or a pistol. This right. was with an AR-15. Yep. This is with your Smith and Wesson MP-15, yep. I think. Yep. Yep. Uh, actually, it was using a UH-1. All right, yep. James yep. Plug. Yep. Sometimes we do that here on the Vortex Nation <laughs> podcast. Uh, <laughs> and um, and how what what's the actual What's this actual drill? What's the sequence of shots? It was okay. pretty crazy. It was a lot it, of it's five yards. Mm-hmm. You got a target. Mm-hmm. Start with a low ready. It had a, had a laser start on it, so the RO timing me could see if I jumped the clock. Oh, okay. And, and yeah, that was, they, that's very important on that drill because I'm trying to make a shot in a quarter of a second, react and make the first shot in about twenty five hundredths of a second. So on the clock at five yards, you come up, you shoot four in the body, transfer it to the head too, and on the right, uh, there's a target a yard center to the right. You transfer to that target, shoot it twice, and then a yard on the other side of the target at five yards is another target. So you shoot two on that one. So it's four, two, two, and two. Oh. Ten shots. And how fast did you do it again? 158. That's one second, point five eight. Right, right, right. So you're trying to get, you're trying to get off the first target at about a 90, a point nine six nine five. Have Have you shot this way for so long that in your head, like in my head, point one second, point four seconds, point nine seconds, it's all the same to me because it's all like, I mean, really fast, right? But to you, it seems like you know the difference between <laughs> point two and point four seconds. Like that's actually, you, you yeah, can you're, almost... Yeah, you can feel a couple of hundred seconds difference. <laughs> yeah, you know, so it, it starts... And what's, what's really amazing about competition, you know, you get to a level where... You get stagnant, you know, you, you, your split times aren't, aren't getting any shorter. Mm-hmm. So you have to find other ways to make a good run. Yeah. So, but the, the split times you know, in between shots is, is, is uh, it's fun to live in that small time frame, see what you can see. Yeah. And sometimes visually you can, you can execute it, and the next time you can't. It's it's uh, it's it's amazing how stupid you can get. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you remember these events, or do they all just kind of like blurs to you? Like, oh, something happened. Now I woke up. People are cheering. Uh, it depends. I've had moments my best shooting where I didn't see anything. You just kind of woke up from it, and, and I've, I've, there my, you were. my best man against man competition is when I'm not seeing. Wow. And it was probably I shot the first time I experienced that was American handgunner. I was shooting against Jethro from the Philippines. He was the uh, fastest pistol shooter at the time. And we went, we went uh, head-to-head for the finals. And it was the best out of seven runs. And he beat me three in a row. Mm-hmm. Scalded me. I looked, like I, was, I looked like I was three years old on the line. He just totally wiped the floor with me. And on the fourth run, I uh, had a perfect run. And I didn't see it. <laughs> and I said, I can't screw this up. And it was I, I, he came back and I got him th- three in a row and then uh, Oof. beat him on the four. Wow! But you just get you just get little glimpses of, of things. Yeah. But you don't really see the whole experience, and uh, you know you got a, you got a really good level when you're doing that. That's perfect. That's yeah. what, That's what you live for. That's pretty special, right there. That's when you that's when you you max out and you you go strictly almost subconscious. Uh, Good stuff. That's impressive. I can do that. With, I can do that when I eat burritos, but it's just not near. Nobody, nobody cheers me on. So you, know, you subscribe to like uh, with winning in mind. Like, have you read that, Lanny uh, Bassam or Basham? I have not. I'm guilty about not reading much on that kind of stuff. Yeah, interesting. Well, what? It's, well, it's, what is it? It speaks to that exact same thing, basically. basically just he probably listened to Jerry and wrote what a book the, about it. That, the hard so thing. The hard thing is to is to is you know when I when I do a class and I and I try to talk to people about uh, uh, about being realistic, you know about expectations. You know I can take a two by six or take take a two by twelve, ten foot long, lay it on the ground. Okay. Everybody in the class can walk it. Okay. I take that same piece of timber, put it up twenty feet. How many people are going to walk it? Put it up two hundred feet or put it up thirty stories. How many people can walk it? Same mo- same motor skill. Yeah, but all of a sudden you have you have an ex you have an expectation of a performance. Yeah, and it's the exact same performance, but once you put a value to it, you get choppy. You feel that. So that's what happens with guys when you get into competition. You feel real choppy, and your motor skills kind of 
and very and it's the same motor scale to walk that piece of timber on the ground that it is 200 feet. I'm not saying I can do it, <laughs> but it's the same motor scale when you go into competition. You, you, have to, you have to overcome that want to do it, mm-hmm. and you just do it. Yeah. Like I threw this water bottle, you know, at Tosti, you just grab it. Right. Now, if you had to think about it. If it's it was gonna, for the Super Bowl. Right. I might. You might. You fumble it because you're trying to make it perfect and you, you put too much into it. So it's a, it's a, it's a real thin, it's a thin line between I want to do really good and I'm just going to let it happen. Yeah. So the expectation, That's you phenomenal. think that like the expectation of an outcome really can change? Oh, it totally does. Hmm. It totally does. I mean, I'm just thinking about like you're bringing up, you know, sports or really anything, you yeah. know, or even uh, we would take uh, general shooting at the range, right? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, whether it's archery or rifle or whatever, then all of a sudden that big buck walks comes out <laughs> mm-hmm. and that changes things a little yeah. bit. Yeah. But I have had, you know, positive outcomes. I don't know if there's a parallel mm-hmm. here or I just blacked out uh, where... Uh, like you get the deer and like you're even trying to like piece together what happened, but it, it happened so fast and everything just kind of took over and it happened and it worked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ad- adrenaline can be a great gift. You know, people say, oh, I get nervous online. I'm saying, that's just exactly where you want to be. Okay. You're at your peak. God give you everything you, that you ever was going to be. You, you got it right now. He gave you that extra push, you know, that extra adrenaline, that extra mm-hmm. horsepower to do what you need to do. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a gift. Don't, don't squander it. Nobody on the line, they worry about their nervous. I'm, I want to get excited. If I don't get a, a tingle out of it, I'm I'm not going to shoot well, especially on speed shooting. Yeah. So, so. <clears throat> how do you balance the like that expectation of performance? How do you balance that when you know you might do better if you really don't care about the outcome, but then how do you <laughs> how do, do you it, get, how do you do it well if you don't care about the right, outcome yeah. and you don't have any adrenaline and how do you get yeah exactly and that adrenaline how do you get pumped up is it process based thinking where you're worried about you're thinking about the process and not the outcome uh that's where that viewing viewing comes in if you watch it happen you're not making it happen huh that's a that's a that's a really technical question but if you break it down into the most simplest form if you watch it happen you're not making it happen but if you try to make it happen you're not in the moment you're trying yeah. to you you're bucking your 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 ability to rely on routine and practice and the timing is off you know how you get on yeah. a match you feel like your timing is off yeah that's because you're trying to make it happen and if you just watch it happen you'll always be at, at that level so you allow yourself to get you know excited have that have that nervous yeah. energy that adrenaline yep. as you lead up to it but once it, say the timer starts then you let that take over and at that moment in time you're watching it you're happen. watching it happen you're not driving you're not driving some people probably what they're so nervous about when they say oh i'm getting the nerves i don't want to get the yep. nerves they're yep. nervous because or they're the reason is because in the past they've seen that that take over once the timer starts once mm-hmm. the buzzer hits they've seen that nervous energy carry on. It starts making them try to make something happen. Whereas more experienced people or people who know to channel that better, they enjoy the nervous energy because they know that they can, once it takes over, they can just sit back and enjoy the ride almost. Not sit yeah. back. Yeah, yeah, not exactly. easy, yeah. You know, yeah. I've talked, watch, watch it. Yeah, you, I've talked yeah. to athletes not in competitive shooting that have told, uh, told me specifically to try and, differentiate the difference between anxiety and and being excited about something so like because sometimes they feel the same way if you're nervous and jittery versus if you're excited and jittery about something um and it's it it can be at times really hard to tell your body that i'm excited to shoot this i'm not nervous right when it feels the same in your stomach and it feels the same in your chest Hmm. Mm -hmm. that's that's true yeah. yeah everybody gets nervous i mean if you wouldn't if you wouldn't get a tingle out of it, why, why would you do it? You no wanna, reason. You want to go cut grass or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go drown worms. God, it sounds, sounds relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree to disagree on the fishing, by the way, Jerry. Uh, <laughs> oh, my gosh. I feel, like, uh, I feel like I'm just getting some incredible life lessons here. Well, what? Yeah, jeez, yeah, Louise. I don't go on forever. What? Is there so that was three world records in one day? Yeah. Now those aren't your only world records. No. Is there one? Is there one that 
we go through all of them because I'm sure they're all actually extremely interesting. But is there right. one that stands out there like that was the most fun or the most memorable or? Yeah. I, I enjoyed working with the AR. That last one I did, that was a lot of fun. Cool. Just had a lot of visual. Share the love one. I had a lot of visual on it. You know, <laughs> I, I came up with some of these drills when I was doing military classes. The guys get kind of bored, so I got to whip up something to keep them keep them interested. <laughs> so I, ha- I have a V drill also with a five target scenario. Mm hmm. Well, it's actually 18 rounds. Oh, and I think I've seen that one. Maybe there's like a target dead in front of you in the yeah. middle and then two yeah. off to the wings right. on each yeah. side. That's, that's a fun drill. You try to shoot, uh, you shoot center, and you, then you shoot right, and you go back to center, and you go back to left, and back to center, then far right, and back to center, and far left. So your target distances grow 50%, but you want your split times to be the same. Oh. So the gun transitions are doubled, but you want to have the same split. So you can't go to sleep on a wheel. Okay. Right. You always have to see more than one target. So you're moving the gun <laughs> essentially faster and further, right. but you're pulling at the, the same, trigger at the yeah, same rate. You want it to sound the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're, okay. you're shooting, you, shooting 18 rounds and you're trying to do that from a low ready. Uh, a really hot run would be like a 3.2 seconds. Okay. That's hot. Whoa. Yeah, that's, you know, that that's, sounds, that's that's a hot run. That sounds pretty hot. Can, <laughs> and and I I uh, I worry I fear the answer, but also it is what it is, and I, I really don't actually. But you know, being in an optics company, I, I, I'm curious. Are you aiming? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You, what, what, now what you, now what you get now that that's a that's a very good that's a very good uh, question because uh, is aiming and is staring at a target. Okay. And aiming can make you stare at a target. Okay. Mm-hmm. So being a, uh, being aware of where the where the muzzle is and how you're seeing the target, the depth perception has a lot to do with whether or not you stare. And well, I, like I said earlier, you never stare at a target mm-hmm. because once you do, the target owns the owns the performance. It's taking your vision away from what you're doing and making you look at it. Mm-hmm. That's why hit probabilities with law enforcement are so low when they're actually in a shooting scenario when they do have staring at the. Target. Because they have to be so justified in everything that they do. By the time they have to bring their firepower to play, they never bring their vision back to their equipment. Huh. So they're shooting through or they're shooting over or around their equipment. And they're still looking at the threat. That's so what should you be looking at then? Well, you don't want to look at the threat anymore. But you have to, you have to justify it to the point to where you have to in- engage it. Mm-hmm. So then what happens is uh, to bring that focal point back to you, it's very hard to do. It takes a lot of training. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it mm-hmm. takes a, it takes a tremendous amount of training. But a lot of a lot of instructors don't know how to instruct that moment of where it, you know because is it a cell phone? Is that a knife? Is that a beer bottle? Oh hell, it's a, it's a gun. I know I have to shoot. It's a justifiable event, and they're exchanging shots, and uh, you get locked into looking over your firearm instead of looking at what you need to do. Like in a target, they go in basically into like a target focus. You get a fixation on the wrong, yeah. wrong mm-hmm. focal plane. Mm-hmm. Is and that, then you never bring it back. Is that why, like, for example... Third, po- f- third focal plane. Third. Yeah, that's uh, a third. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, it, is that why, and, and I don't want to... Biggest thing everybody knows that we don't like to just do, like, you know, hard sales or anything like that, any of this stuff. But, for example, there is the JM1 reticle in the 1 to 6 razor. Yeah. Yep. Is that why, for example, in that one, super simple reticle, yep. not much going on, right? And there's just a nice, super bright center dot. Like when you're shooting through that thing, is it just like put the dot on the thing? And the way that optic is set up, uh, you know, you read about the scout rifles and everything, you know, with the optics up forward. Mm-hmm. That's because they never had a good scope. <laughs> I'm just serious. If, if back then you you were like looking through a straw, mm-hmm. right? All, all, right. You know, you had like a 33 foot field of view. Or, I never you know, thought of it that or way. 38. So, I mean, so you wanted to get to where you could look over your firearm and then acquire the optics and mm-hmm. the target. But when, it, when you have a 120-foot field of view and you're on one power with a centrally lit reticle, it's faster. It's, it's 10 times faster than a scout rifle. Mm-hmm. And it's way more repeatable because it's so close to your dominant eye mm. that you don't have to look downrange and then bring the weapon up or the firearm and then see... Yeah, with the with the one power, it's so it's so quick and 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 instinctive that you would you would throw that scope that scout stuff out the window. Yeah, so are you seeing that that center reticle, like that red dot in there? Is that what you're seeing? You're kind of utilizing, or are you even 
not trying to focus on that too much too is it just is it all just everything's being seen in one and you just got to kind of picture what it all look like you can it, you can do both if it's if it's a, if it's a really large target up close you really don't want to stare at that red dot mm-hmm. you just want to look at look at through it like just it's a, just like it's a window yeah and there's something centering your vision or if you want to pick out a small minute spot on the target for a very precision shot you can do that also okay mm-hmm. but the idea is never to stare at the target. Right. Because the target's won the moment. I feel like... Did you ever <laughs> buy like into the gun, like the uh, scout rifles? I did. I had, matter of fact, in one of my 22 rifles, I had a, I had a, a Tasco pistol scope out on that barrel a long time ago hmm. on a nylon 66. Yeah. And I, I shot a lot of stuff with it off the front of that air bullet. We used to go shoot neutrals with it. I've got a lot of hours behind one. So I can, I can tell you what they huh. do and what they don't do. Yeah. And the whole idea behind that that pistol scope on the end of that twenty two rifle is a nylon sixty six is so flexible. Yeah. That when you have a receiver mounted sight, you could take the stock and bend it and it would shoot <laughs> left or you could bend it and it would shoot right. That's the original Kentucky windage. It yeah. was, but but the gun was so That's reliable. Some... The gun is so reliable. Nylon sixty six is probably if you had to if you said take one gun, I would take it. Really? Yeah. Really? But, but oh you, my goodness! But I'd, I'd want even to, over an AK. But but I'd want the optic mounted on the barrel. Yeah. Huh. Wow. Very they're, interesting. They're pretty much indestructible. Shoot them underwater all you want. <laughs> Come That's home. what we're really looking for. There, <laughs> shooting them underwater. We need to get one now. I found that my. We do. I found my takeaway early on yes. this one. I've got yes. one in the family. I'm gonna try and track it down. Good. They're, um, they're indestructible. Oh man! Every time I feel like I thought of something to say, he brings up something just incredible <laughs> that I, that's way better than what I thought I was going to say. Um, but going back to going back to uh, talking about just, I feel like what Jerry's doing is he has two eyes. I can see it plain as day right here in front of me. You can all, if you're watching on YouTube on these cameras right now, you can see the guy has two eyes. But he's doing the job. Those eyes are doing the jobs of like four or five or maybe six eyes because he's just like <laughs> see, everything's being seen. At different, it's uh, it's crazy. I I heard Jerry talk about vision when I first started getting into competitive shooting, and <clears throat> when I started shooting, I I was shooting production in USPSA, and so shooting iron sighted uh, M and P's and Glocks were very very popular, and when I heard Jerry talk about the different types of focus. Um, the one thing I would do instead of, you know, when you're starting hands relaxed at sides, one of the things I would do is instead of like looking at the target, cause I would always see guys starting their hands would be relaxed and they would be looking at the target. And I always thought, you know, I wondered there, there's gotta be a certain amount of time that it takes your eyes to focus from staring at that target. And then when you put a pistol in front of it, yeah, it's taking time for your eyes to change They're all back. settled into that. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things after listening to Jerry, years ago i would stare down at my thumb before i would draw and then when i would draw the gun my eyes were already focused at this distance here Mm -hmm. and that was like a game changer when i was starting doing a lot of pistol shooting you didn't get seasick from looking at your gun and then going up and looking up and moving oh i fainted many times on it yeah no no, i never had well that's just because somebody probably fed you sausage yeah or mark corn starched right right <laughs> for reference ruben is highly allergic allergic to pork uh, yeah uh, anyway but yeah that is uh, the, the vision, vision thing vision, is it's, it's it's really a big yeah. deal but if you talk to anybody in any sport arguably the biggest thing that they talk about is vision i yeah. mean you look at you yep. watch you know watch espn see any sport that's happening uh, you know, football, basketball. Um, you know, Eddie here does boxing, and I've been trying a few things with him. And you know, it's like if you're not looking in the right place, you're gonna wind up out of position, and get your head cracked. You know, I mean, everything. It's, it's everything is visually oriented. Uh, fighter pilots. Uh, yes. Boxing. It all has way to look and what not. It's not like you you're being faster than anybody else, but you're not wasting time. Mm-hmm. What you do when you watch a professional at any at anything that he does, it looks makes it look easy mm-hmm. because he's 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 removed everything that doesn't add to the performance. Yeah. So when you're there, you're trying to do all kind of stuff that you think is going to add to the performance, and it's just wasting time. You, it might be a little flash, but it doesn't add to the to the bottom line. So you're wasting time. So as you progress through any technique or of, of any sport, uh, you look, you talk to skeet shooters. They say they want to see the dome of the of the bird. Yeah. You know, the leading edge, that's how hard they want to look at it. 
So are yeah. you are you a pretty good skeet shooter? Uh, I'm a fair shotgun shooter. That's a, that's that's another game. That's that's a different game. Yeah. So I, I did shoot a lot of shotgun. We had the uh, sportsman team challenge. We shot that for I don't know twenty something years. So there was a lot of shotgunning in there. So we did cool. have we had a lot of shotgunning. I'm starting something similar at my house every fall. It has a lot of different activities, but I think we're going to call it the sportsman team challenge. Completely, Are we just going to leave it at that? Completely different. Axe just, throwing, yeah. We're just going to leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. It's invite only, so oh, okay. keep your mailbox <laughs> under close examination. Stay, t- stay tuned. <laughs> it's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. <laughs> huge. Um, so, uh, Jerry, this will switch gears a little bit, but one thing you've alluded to a couple times is you know, you've done some various classes and you had some trainings with military and things like that. Um, one thing that we've heard and that I think has been debated or debunked or, or, you know, to some people confirmed, whatever is the old adage competition stuff. And that speed shooting fast and fancy will get you killed in the streets or that's not legit. That's not how actually people would wind train up. Like you fight, train like you fight. Exactly. So for somebody like yourself with this background in competitive shooting, shooting fish underwater and speed shooting, um, Oh How? wait! Did you do you ever do bowling pin? Oh yeah! I want to hear about that after this. We okay. shot we shot a lot of bowling pins. N- all right, noted. Bowling pin for sure. <laughs> How do you transition that into then training? Uh, you know, military, law enforcement, and other private citizens for actual duty use. When I when I instruct anybody in that profession, I don't instruct them in tactics. I'm strictly working on marksmanship. Sure. Okay. Right. You know. So. Uh, how to make that thing run, what to do with it when it's up in level. Uh, the other part, you know, the room entries and uh, tactics is the, what I always consider is the how, the how you want to die. So everybody's tactics is different. So and not any one tactic is going to work. If you talk to the military guys, they're going to they're going to accept a 30 percent or a 40 percent loss ratio in a room entry. You know, so many times, so many people going to get going to get not going to make it home and. So I'm not I'm not into that. I don't know anything about it. So I'm not even going to try to. Be, I'm not qualified to instruct that. That's fair. So uh, my own personal experience is uh, putting horsepower on a target. Yeah, faster than the other guy. Okay. So, and so the big you're pretty much then doing a lot of the same stuff you'd be doing in yes, competition, yeah. which is just right. probably mostly the the visual aspect yep. of it. And hopefully, yep. once they've implemented their tactics, things to get them in the right place, yep. then it's not yet another conscious effort they need to do right. to actually put the rounds on target. You have to spend a lot of time to build up reaction, uh, to minimize reaction time and how to, how to get your whatever you got, whatever platform you have in your hands to up, to, up to, to performance. And that's where exposure and competition. Uh, if you can't go to a competition and shoot well, you're not going to go, you're not going to be John Wayne. You know, we used to, we, <laughs> I did some concealed carry classes and I, everybody's buying these guns, and they stick them in a glove box, or they put them under the floor mat of the car, and they, they think it's going to be John Wayne. And I said, well, look, guys, if, if you uh, went into a, say, a, you, and you bought a violin, you put it in the trunk of your car, and you drive around with it for six years, and you, and you, and, <laughs> no, 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 wait, no, wait, no, wait, no, uh, you got this violin in the trunk of your car, and all of a sudden, there's a, there's a concert uh, going on. You're going to jump on the stage and be a concert violinist? <laughs> I don't think so. So why would you carry a gun and have the same expectations? That's a dang it. You know, really I mean? good point. I uh, you're yeah, not, you're not. You're not. You're gonna fumble. You're gonna. You're gonna. I ain't gonna say the other words, but and I I I pay a lot of money to travel all around the world and, and screw up. Mm-hmm. And I learned from it. And I've had a lot of screw ups. I wish I could sit here and say, look, everything I did was hundred percent. I want everything I ever shot. I went to a lot of places and shot very poorly. Mm-hmm. under pressure but then you learn you, you catalog it you come back you go okay that, that didn't work <laughs> we're going to try this and then but you, that's how you that's how you become a better competitor so if you buy a handgun if you're going to use it for self-defense in the moment of your life where you're going to be under the most stress that you can ever imagine and uh you're not going to be john wayne hmm. got to put the hours in that's right. So, dang it! Not, every time not going to be a concert violinist. This. I hate to break yeah. your heart. Every time we talk <laughs> about this stuff, it's I don't want to be either. Practicing and doing, and taking all the time and practice, practice, practice. Hey, so right. on practice. So you and I have talked before, and you've said 
there's a lot of things that'll take you a thousand rounds or five thousand rounds before you kind of have that like aha moment. Yep. Is is there still value? Because let's just say you um you have a couple other really good shooters in the household, mm-hmm. um, specifically Lena, who's yep. come up uh you know kind of shooting with you and learning a lot of stuff from you. Is there? I mean, is is all the the time that you spent learning something and all the thousands of rounds, can you transfer that knowledge to somebody and do they still get the same out of it, the same benefit uh, without having that aha moment of having gone through all that? Oh, yeah. You know, that, that's a very good question. And I'll, and I'll give you an example, which is Lena. I've shot, of course, my wife Kay is a world-class competitor. I don't know how many yeah. championships and world titles and three gun and all this other stuff she's done. She's an excellent shooter. Mm-hmm. I cannot get her to see the way I see. You know, we talk visual stuff and yeah. it, and it, and she's a great competitor, but I never could get her to see this. When Lena was coming up, well, just a couple of years ago I was working with her and I said, this is how you need to see this. And she clicked on it like within, you know, 10 minutes. She said, okay, what's next? I went, what? <laughs> 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 Took me 20 years to see that. And of course, she, she sees the same way I see. And then, and when I when I do when I do classes, I could have like say twenty guys on the line, and out of the twenty, I might have two of them, or maybe one that they can see. Uh, B. J. Norris, yep. When he when he came to our junior program years ago, he came through the program I think three three times three different years. When B. J. was on the line, I was watching him shoot. When he was a young guy, I like to take some credit for him anyway. Excellent speed shooter. Yeah. And I was telling him how to see things. And he started clicking on it. I mean, instant, instant. Hmm. Uh, it's just so. When during the class, I'd just get BJ up on the front, and say, "BJ, show these other juniors how to do this." And he would, you know, he could he could repeat it. He could visually. Uh, he has he has fast eyes. Mm-hmm. He knows how to see fast, and that's a hard way to explain it. But yeah, yeah. But a lot, the- a lot of people they want to see too much. They try to make it too complicated. And they they it takes them a long time to break through that layer of uh, complication. And BJ never, and Lena, Lena especially had a good eye for it. Yeah. So when I first started working with you about five years ago, you told me something, and you you told me that a lot of people think of seeing as a reactive act, and he told me that seeing is you have to be proactive. You have to you're seeing and you're trying to see something. A lot of people see it as just an input, just something that's coming into your eyes. You actually mm-hmm. have to yeah. try to see certain ways. Yeah. That always stuck with me. Is part of shooting fast? Sorry, well, actually, finish your thought there, because then no, I'll, go ahead. Yep, I'm, I, I was going to ask because it at least it sounds like this to me, but it sounds like part of shooting fast is almost like letting go a little bit. Is that does that come into play at all? Like almost like I mean, yeah, you definitely need to practice and know your firearm, but then also let go and let your mind and body just kind of work. Almost in like that supercomputer atmosphere. If, if yeah, when you get to the final product, that's what you're doing. Okay, you're just going. You hmm. just you're just going. You're viewing it. You view it. That's total let go. Yeah, I'm yeah. not in control. It's, yeah. it's happening. I'm watching it. I might drive a little bit here and there. Uh, Brian Edis was very keen on that of watching it, a performance and not making it happen. Mm-hmm. I remember we t- talking about bowling pins. Mm-hmm. Brian and I were at Second Chance one year, and I was waiting to get on the line. We were signing in, had a big waiting list. So we were talking about, Brian was talking about, you know, visualization. And he said to him, his pistol was hanging by a, a balloon, and he was just letting it float out there and shoot targets. And, that, you know, Brian had that I wasn't yeah. going to drive kind of a thing going. Yeah. Okay. So we, we talked this strategy for like an hour and a half while we were waiting in line. So the, I had signed up to shoot nine pin which is nine bowling pins with a nine millimeter revolver. I mean, a pistol, I'm sorry. Oh, this is a form of competition. This here, is, yeah, 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 this, pin, yeah, this, this is, is that. You had like 17 different events you could shoot. I thought this was going on at the at the dump, actually. No, yeah, it, I this, actually this, thought this, this was, was a, an upgrade. This was that second chance. And uh, that, was, that was in Central Lake, Michigan. So I'm getting ready to shoot this event. And Brian and I are shooting the breeze about this and that. <laughs> and I said, well, okay. So I got up on the line and I said, I'm just going to, you know, shoot everyone in the center, you know, and. Tied the, tied the record on the first run, 2.7 seconds. And in my mind, it was like slow motion. Hmm. And I, when I, the last pin went off the table. I, I went to low, and everybody was hollering behind me. You know, the crowd was right there. And I looked back, everybody, I'm going like, 
2.7. And I went, whoa. And after that, I couldn't clean the table. <laughs> it was gone because I tried to make it happen. Oh. I shot like nine tables. First one was the winner. The other eight were just wasting ammo and my time. <laughs> but once Jeez. I, you know, in my mind, when I shot the first run, I was just, you know, just, just shooting. Mm-hmm. Then after that, I tried to make it happen, and all the wheels fell off. Shoot! So that was that part of the learning curve. I mean, you're just going to get online; you got to learn. Yeah. And second chance was a was a uh, really a hard match to shoot well because you had big power factor. We were shooting 38s loaded up to about a 210, 230 power factor. So we had 200 grain bullets doing 1200, and we had 230 grain bullets doing a thousand. Oh, <laughs> gee. <laughs> So we had okay. a, lot, a lot of power factor. Okay. So when the, when the clock went off, you had these big, powerful guns, and you're shooting rapid fire, you know. <laughs> so it's uh, it's fun. Wow. <laughs> it's like a, it, is it's power like factor a an actual kick to the to hand every time? Power factor is a number. I was gonna say it's a calculable it, yeah. number. Yeah. Al- yeah. Okay, that's what I'm yeah. yeah. It's a calculated it's, uh, number. It's a grain weight times a velocity divided by a thousand or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Man, we, we shot heavy bullets. Oh, jeez. Rube, what were you talking about proactively seeing that? Are you talking about almost like visualizing the course ahead of time that we were saying earlier, proactive? Yeah, so with your the way that I understand the kind of that whole thought process is that, like, your eyes can be receiving an image, but you can yeah. also be dictating what you're seeing by um, driving vision from place to place. Oh, okay. That sounded interesting. I don't even, I hardly even... Depth, depth, per, depth perception has a lot to do with how fast yeah, you see. Switching focus at different distances and. Oh, okay. Huh. You could try it sometime, right? Just hold your a pistol. Eyes yeah, yeah. <laughs> third foc- the whole third focal. Third plane focal thing. plane. Oh, okay. Now it's <laughs> yeah, clicking. So Sorry, it's kind of yeah. like Inception, but yeah. when you take a pistol and you hold it up, you can either focus on the, the sights or you can focus on the target. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And every time you you try and do that, you can actually feel your eyes changing you can feel focus. the muscles contracting right inside. yeah so what i would try and do is you do that over and over 50 yards to your front sights 50 yards to your front sights or further that's an actual and you actually workout. feel your eyes yeah that's why your eyes get strained after a long yeah. day of doing something that's very repetitive so um can you, you actually can, i mean is that like exercising are you essentially yes. exercising a and muscle you have and to know what it your feels optometrist like will even sometimes recommend that you do that stuff i think from what i've heard mm-hmm. sometimes people will get like a like a lazy eye or some yep. you know i don't know what the actual term is but they'll, they'll have people do that stuff hmm. what i was always amazed at is how many people never did any point shooting what's point point shooting you know like hip shooting oh wait what Hip shooting with a pistol or talking shot, about just like rifle. from the hip, yeah, yeah. hip shooting. Real well, John Wayne. Point Jerry was sick shooting. of talking about vision, so he wanted to move yeah. on. No, so, but no, but that's exactly that's a, that's yeah. a, that's a beautiful explanation of, of visual technique. It's point shooting. You can actually do that accurately. I didn't say I could do it accurately, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I can I can do enough of it to get away with a lot of circumstances. But it's it's a vision skill game. It just uses a bigger a bigger sighting uh, aperture. Okay. How do you? Was you, you, you ever see a shotgun exhibition guy shoot a shotgun over his head? Sure, sure, oh, okay, behind yeah. his, uh, behind cool his back. Point, point, yeah, like point cool brothers. Shoot, point yeah. shooting. I always just thought okay. they were really just like good at guessing. What? No, it's 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 a, it's a bigger aperture on on field of view. They're just using their scene as that right. they're seeing as right. their sight. That's the whole you know the visual experience. He's still sighting. Now, oh. if you if you if you put a piece of card, say we're shooting behind his back. Yeah. And you put a piece of cardboard on the side of his face where he couldn't see the end of the muzzle, he's not going to hit a thing. Huh. So he's point shooting. Well, he has to have a reference, and the reference is over here instead of in, in front of him or from the hip. That's hmm. crazy. So the aperture changes. That's crazy. You see what I mean? Yeah. So that when you understand, when you understand vision techniques, you, sh- you have to take it to that level. They appreciate, like, coming out of the holster, mm-hmm. how to get the first shot. How to transfer between targets? What am I seeing oh, between right. targets? Right. Am I staring at the target? What am I seeing? And can I see more than one target at a time? Yeah. So, the point shooting gives you a bigger aperture, and sometimes a lot, a lot of guys have never trained. I was surprised how many soldiers never trained in point shooting. It's, I guess, it seems, seems like something that could happen. It it can happen. You know, in, in Vietnam, uh, back in the Vietnam era, Daisy BB gun sold a a basic BB gun to the Army without any sights on it. It was called Quick Kill. 
and the civilian version was called Quick Scale, and it had a sight. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so how do we the, make the, this the civ- we'll put an S on it. Politically correct. So what what you got in the box was a little BB gun. You had some little plastic disc come with it, and you would throw it up, and you'd have a soldier with the BB gun with no sights, and he'd throw a disc up, and you'd shoot at it. Yeah. And you'd point shoot at it because there was no sights. Or you roll it on the ground and you'd shoot at it. That's like what they used to say some of the best ace pilots back in the day in dogfighting used to do, I think. Because those guys used to... That's a lot of... Inst- well, back when you had to lead without Instinctive. a sight. Yeah. So you looked at the object and you could judge the speed and you arced your rounds into it. Right. Same thing, you know, shooting a shotgun. So guys who went in the military, what they found in Vietnam... Uh, you had a you had a soldier come in. They gave him boot camp for a little bit of time, and then they, you know, standing, kneeling, sitting prone, and they threw him into combat in the jungle. You don't have time to use a sling. You don't have time to even see a peep sight. Some of the combat, you know, the distances were hit at a wall or closer. Yeah. So a guy would come up and can't find his sights and hesitate on the trigger, and he, then he's not there anymore, hmm. or the target is left. Right. So the idea was to learn how to point shoot. It sounds very basic, but as a kid, you know, we had BB guns. That's what we did. We did all that stuff. I mean, you shot bow and arrow. You shot, you know, BP gun from the hip. You did all this kind of stuff, aerial targets. My buddy and I, I don't know how many cartons of 22 bullets I shot into the sky, you know, shooting aerial targets, you know, throwing up stuff mm-hmm. and shooting at it. Yeah. So you learn how to point shoot. You learn how to see your bullets coming out of your 22 rifle. Yeah. You could actually shoot by watching the arc of the bullet <laughs> against the sky. So you do all that, and you learn how to point shoot. Yeah. You know? Wow. Just like that. Just like that. Right. <laughs> right. So when now that now that optics and uh and and I know we're we're at an hour here, but so many so many questions we can ask. I gotta ask this one though. Now, I feel like we've uncovered about twenty different topics yes. that we've just brushed the surface. Just great. On. It's good. We just grazed them, Jim. That's right. Now that optics have come into play, again we'll go back to let's say you're using like the razor one to six or something like that. How does that Obviously, you use that scope a lot. When I'm thinking of vision, the way that it almost sounds like you're describing it, and granted, I, I guess I haven't seen it yet, probably the way that you're seeing it, but when I think of vision, I almost think of like, you know, open top red dot, something that has as little in, the, in my way as possible. But then when I think of looking through like a 1 to 6, I, I picture even when you're on one power with a 1 to anything, it's, it's a little bit different than how it looks normally right i mean even though that optic is giving you a true 1x image you're still it's it's producing that image inside of an optic that then has that image at a certain focal point that's at an eye relief that you have to meet up with and it's going to be slightly a little bit different than the scene around it how has that changed things or has it even changed things with the way you see and aim or you know does that make well, well, what you were saying, you you were almost to the point where I was going to say, "Okay, I got you," but you kind of you kind of. <laughs> I probably screwed okay. it up. No, Sorry, you, Jerry. You, no, on on true one power, the, the the beauty of that thing, you shoot with both eyes open. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So once you once you start closing an eye, you're starting looking through, mm-hmm. and not looking. So you're a lot, your left eye, right? That's right. your non-dominant so when eye. You, right. So when you close off one of your eyes, you start looking through, mm-hmm. and not you're not seeing flat anymore. Right. So to shoot that optic correctly on one power, you shoot flat with both eyes open. You don't give it any depth perception. You don't try to look through. You just look. Yeah. And, and when and when you do that, does it? Do you wind up with pretty much the it's same? same it's same times. Same, same same deal. Same times. I was running. Okay. I was running the V drill with it, and I was running the STL drill with it and stuff. And if you shoot it right without staring through it, you'll shoot it just as fast. Okay. So that's the beauty part of it. And yeah. It, and you can flip it up to six and shoot out to whatever. Right, and that's you know, that's so the convenient a, that's, thing. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah, but I figured I'd ask that though, because yeah. you, you you always hear people asking about you know if I get a one to six, is it really going to be as good? It is know, good. Like that? I, that's that's uh, that's a game changer. That that optic when it came along, it just like made three guns so much easier. Yeah, it was. It's a beautiful moment. It really was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how long uh, how, how much you really uh, appreciate it till you try to shoot something different. Right. One thing that's important when you are mounting and zeroing and getting that optic set up for you whether it be you know that razor one to six or any other optic that's a one to something um it's important to set the diopter on one power optics so that you get a nice flat field of view you're not necessarily yeah you're not necessarily worried about 
as much about getting that reticle just crystal clear and perfect as you are about getting that optic set to true one power because your diopter right. actually adjusts magnification up and down slightly. Yeah. So enough that a lot you of people will, will say, yeah, they'll say when I look through it, it looks like it has some magnification. Or or unmagnification, mm -hmm. if negative, that's the word. Yep, negative, negative magnification. magnification. Yeah. And so it's I just always call it fishbowl. Yeah. Ah, I'm fishbowling. I don't know which way I am. I'm just fish bowling twisting. <laughs> fish bowling. I just twist it until it gets right. We're shooting bowling pins. We're shooting fish. We're fish bowling. I don't hey, know. Hey, yeah. Shooting fish, bowl, all, all fish bowling pins. That's all good stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> A lot of stuff, Jim. Yes. We shot a lot of bowling pins. Bowling uh, pins sounds That's cool. kind of dangerous, isn't it? Is that it? a thing anymore? Uh, do they still do they, that? It just came back. Richard started his match again. Yeah. Oh, cool. But I think he's on his third year. But I shot it, for, I don't know, 20, 20 years, I think. Yeah. I won a bunch of guns there. Last time I shot a second chance, I had won 17 or 21 guns. There. Wait, not you mean in one thing? or in Yeah, the last year. I think it was 98 or 99 when he had the last... Uh, the, the original second chance bowling pin matches. That's a haul. It was like, I think it was 14 ARs mm. and a 38 Super Race gun and some other stuff. It was a fun week. Richard <laughs> mo Richard's motto was shoot till you puke. He had nine, <laughs> he had nine days of shooting. I live by that motto. And uh, you, we'd go up there with just cans of ammunition, and it had uh, 17 events I think you could shoot then. They had slug gun. They had submachine gun. They had uh, mixed doubles. that. You know, a uh, uh, man and a woman team, a three-man team. It was uh, just about anything you could think of. Eight-pin, five-pin. So it was just incredible. It was a lot of fun. I found my new sport. Yep, yep. Shoot till you and, a, and, a, and a bowling pin. I don't know if you ever saw Richard when he when he demonstrated his first vest. Richard hmm. Richard Davis. Uh -uh. Richard Richard started off in the in the uh, pizza business. Of all. Okay. And somewhere in Detroit, if I remember the story right, and he had one of his pizza guys went out one night and got robbed. Yep, it happened, you know. So next day, you get a phone order from the same location. So Richard goes, give me them pizza boxes. So he fills them up with guns, and he's walking in the alley, and three guys jump him. And he went, he went into a gunfight with him. He was standing flat foot with him, shooting, having a shootout with him. <laughs> and he got shot up a little bit. And uh, he's laying in the hospital thinking, Richard's thinking, hey, man, i got to come up with something better than this, you know. If I want to be in the pizza business, I'm about <laughs> to probably be doing this pretty often, and I want to be a survivor. So <laughs> <laughs> so he's thinking, i got to come up with something. So he started reading about Kevlar. And the, the, the word back then on Kevlar, even though it was lightweight and pliable, is that if you caught a round over your heart or something, the blunt trauma would transmit enough energy where it would rupture your heart and you would die anyway. Huh. So Richard said, well, let's go find out. So he steps in the backyard. He's got a little camera set up there. He's got a he's got a coat revolver of some caliber, thirty eight or three fifty seven or something. And he puts it to his chest and he goes, "Okay, let's do it." And he shoots himself over the heart. And uh, he lived to tell about it and made a million million bucks out of it. So, jeez. <laughs> That man likes to gamble. Now, Richard, now, the, now <laughs> I mean, he didn't just say, I'm out of the pizza business. I'm done. <laughs> no. Right. What, that what, what, that what, Detroit pizza business, let's just say that Detroit pizza game is. What, what made Richard famous with his vest was he would, he would have a, he would go to a police department and say, like, whatever, big PD, and he'd stand there on the range and he said, somebody bring me, a, bring me a duty gun. So a guy would have a 357 magnum on and say, bring it up. And he'd just take a gun and say, this is your gun, your ammo? Yep. He handed it back to him. He said, "Whose vest are you gonna Good buy?" Lord. Did this guy have a chest that looked like like the moon, <laughs> like the surface of the moon? I mean, just craters and well. I mean, there's but no he, way that's comfy. No, it's not comfy. Matter of fact, uh, Richard, I got a, I got a million Richard Davis stories. <laughs> I had twenty twenty some years of them, but uh, he actually hired a guy later on that he would shoot, <laughs> 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 and they would document the. Uh, the How actual, do I explain this? You don't get any life insurance or any benefits. And, I'm had, just gonna and they shoot would document you. the shooting, you know, and they would have a folder like an hour after the shot, two weeks, <laughs> a month. That was a pretty brutal job. Okay. <laughs> How the, the job description? Do, I do you have nothing to lose? <laughs> No, are yeah. you sad? I'm qualified. Are you sad? But, but one thing you have to realize too, <laughs> he saved um, uh, I don't know eight nine hundred officers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. During, during his vest manufacture, he really he truly loved helping law enforcement. That is incredible. As, as wild as his stories were, 
that Richard had a good he had a good heart. And he he loved he loved to help people. Well, he had a good heart. He probably had a pretty he strong had a really tough heart. yeah a tough heart. tough heart yeah. But uh, and he a hell was, of a he, sales he was, pitch. He, was, he had a, he had a sales pitch you couldn't beat. You know who's who's the vest you're going to buy? He was standing there and shoot himself. I don't even so. know. Like I mean, is that the presentation? Like I just hey get guys, up there. I don't want to waste any of your guys' time with all this. You know, yeah. kind of just jargon. need five minutes. If anybody yeah. could just bring me their duty <laughs> gun, I'll just get this over with right now. Bang! Ow. Yeah, I got, I got I got twenty seven oh, years of Richard great. Davis story. Man. Oh, yeah, we got a salesman coming in today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, no, that's the guy that shoots himself. Oh, that's gonna yeah, be good. Yeah. Bring the popcorn. Yeah, I'll turn yeah, off. Yeah, if you if you get interested, oh, look, look so him up. So. It's only he's, gonna uh, take his, five minutes. His footage is, is is on YouTube. I can't wait. If you look it up, it's uh, interesting. And very uh, he uh, he pioneered a lot of a lot of body armor. Yeah, saved a lot of saved a lot of lives. So crazy, that awesome, is good guy, incredible, amazing. Well, <laughs> we've taken up, I think, enough of Jerry's time for today. Of course, we would love to take up tons more time. Maybe we'll get the chance in the future. Jerry, maybe one of these shot shows or something like that yeah. coming up. Who knows? We yeah. might get you on for yeah. more. Maybe just a podcast called Richard Davis Stories. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I wrote that down. <laughs> but um, what do you say? I, I know I had one more question. It's a quick one, and then and then maybe we can hand it off to Jerry for the final closing. What do you think, Mark? I know Fair you're, you're a man of seven last calls. I know. I only, <laughs> had, right? I only had three. Let's go. Just three. My only question that I, that I wanted to ask before we before we departed, and, and I was thinking, do I ask about his his television uh, career, or do I ask about what it was like to shoot the Barrett, the <laughs> semi-automatic Barrett 50 cal really fast, and I think it, I'm going to go with the Barrett. How, can you explain real fast for the listeners out there, if they haven't seen it on YouTube, which if you haven't, I don't know how, uh, what you did with the Barrett 50 cal, and and what that was like. Okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll sum it up for you. I never shot a 50 Barrett before when that thing showed up. I put <laughs> I put a one by six on it. Yeah. Shot it twice, sighted in, and I said, "Let's race." <laughs> 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 so the, the the first rapid fire, I I had two shots in the gun. So the first rapid fire was six rounds in a second. And. It wasn't fully automatic, right? This no, was semi-automatic. No, no. Unbelievable. The gun functions about that speed, that about 1700s. After that, it, you know, it, it just doesn't function any faster. Yeah, you, you th- at that point, if you try, if you went any faster, you would then be outpacing the gun. Right, but if you watch the video, when as soon as the bolt closes, it fires. That's the part, because I remember Ryan Muckenhern, he was watching the video, and we were looking at it in slow motion. And yeah. Ryan, Ryan Muckenhern <laughs> is standing there, right up next to the computer screen, he's going, there! There is no way. I mean, he was tearing his hair out. But the gun, the it's gun incredible. actually has a good rhythm to it. Okay. When you when you shoot a lot of long guns, some of them talk to you really nice. That one had a. It just felt like that's the okay. way it wanted. That's where it wanted to race. That's a sweet talker. You know, it just went boom, 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 boom. Okay, I can do this. <laughs> All right. Wow. That's cool. I want to do it, that now. It, it just feels. It just where it, it it's where it wanted to live. It's where it wants to live. Best part is that it was offhand too. Anyway, if you haven't seen it, you got to go see. It. If you have seen it, go watch it again. Um, oh, good stuff. But fun you, stuff. That's what makes life on the range fun. It it so does. It does. You have to entertain yourself in different ways. <laughs> uh, Jerry, as we close out, our guests always give the best closeouts. If Mark and I try to do it, it's, it's never as good. So we figure uh, if if you can follow your heart, finish this out. However you'd like to. What's what's the last thing you'd like to leave the listeners with on this one? I'd like to I'd like to compliment Vortex. No, if, is, is that is that okay? I, I, sure. I know I'm you know I think I'm staging this. We'll slip you the twenty later. Sure. Okay, but you know what <laughs> what what really amazes me is how big and beautiful this complex is, and it was all built on on one. Uh, uh, let me see, I can say that and be correct. It's built on one statement: the customer is always right. So here you are, and here I am. I just want to be a part of it. Thank you. Here we are. Well, we appreciate it, Jerry. Yep. Thanks thank for joining thank, us. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening, as always. Happy hunting and shooting out there. And, uh, boy, I hope we get tons of questions and all kinds of interest <laughs> on this. If you haven't checked out uh, Jerry's YouTube page, uh, definitely go subscribe. Heard you guys just went over a million lately, too, so yep. go check that out and subscribe. And uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Very good. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. That's not our most popular podcast when it releases. I don't know what. <laughs> I don't know what ways. <laughs> no, I, was, I was telling that to John when we were driving up to this place. You know how big it is, and it was all because the customer's right.
Yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. You treat a guy right, yeah, you come back. So. It's kind of weird how that works. You know, it's yeah, kind of like yeah. when you say the pros, they make it all look simple. What's the guy's name? It's like sometimes just the body armor guy. Sometimes just oh, treating people remember, well is simple. What's Richard, the body armor? Richard Davis. Richard Davis. Oh, man, you know what? It was funny when we did that podcast with Adam Weber and we talked about slinging Bobby Douglas or oh, Billy Bobby, Davis. Billy da- Bobby Davis, Billy Davis. Yeah, something like yeah, that. I was like, is this the same guy? <laughs> <laughs> slinging Bobby Douglas. That's what he called him. That's right. Yeah, that semi-truck driver that yeah. sat in the, in the late night Denny's or whatever with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's fun. That, that was, was great. This was, that was incredible. Oh, my Thanks, gosh. Jerry. Appreciate I it. had some questions and answers. I've got a million other questions. So like, many. This was just like, oh, my gosh. We're going to have to go awesome. shoot some fish underwater. That's also that's also Ooh, that's a lot of fun. fun. <laughs> oh, we kill a bunch of fish. <laughs> no, 22, that water we, we used to shoot in, because there's a flooded timber, you know, so the water would be, you know, like, like so you could grab that buttstock and that, that nylon, 66, and put your finger in the trigger guard, and when you tap the fish, you, you give them a burst. Really? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> give, him a, give him a two or three round burst. <laughs> that's where the, did that's you where ever, the speed uh, shooting must have originated. Just that. Yeah. yeah. yeah the work really that's that, 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 you know, that's the original uh, bump stock. Bump stock it was, yeah. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> that's funny. I killed a 50-something pounder one day. Did you ever eat any of that stuff? Yeah. Yeah, gar, yeah you did? Gar, okay. Yeah. yeah. Gar, 50 brother. pounder. My little brother went back the next day and killed a hundred and six pound oh, gar. With his Goodness. gun? He went my forty five seventy. <laughs> <laughs> the he buffalo. Didn't, he didn't shoot it underwater, but he did he did bust it though. You could actually get four or five foot of water with that rifle. You know, wow. If you knew how to aim. Really? Yeah. Hard lead, you know, he treats the bullets, it'll aim slightly under Yeah, always under. Yeah, okay. always under. Okay. Yeah. So when that water was about that deep, you'd, you'd offset about you you far. Yeah. That airboat deck was about yeah. So. Right off the airboat. Well, you said yeah, like probably like a heavy long. I know, like when you shoot them with you know fish arrows, or these yeah. super heavy yeah. fiberglass right, right. arrows. You yeah. know. You got to have a hard bullet because if it's a soft nose or anything, the water shatters it. So. Yeah. The heavier, the slower the bullet, the better. High an- animal level. Yeah. You ever heat treat cast bullets? No, I haven't, but I, I've, I know guys that have. Yeah, he can make them hard as glass. Almost. Yeah. What about those brass bolts we were shooting, Jerry? Uh, those brass rounds we were shooting a couple weeks ago. Those yeah, we had some, that was 458 SOCOM, solid brass. Going through solid concrete. That was, thing went through like four inches of concrete <laughs> and hit the other one. It fell right down on the ground. Didn't even bend it. I mean, it was. Yeah, the bullet come out just the same way it went in. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I, think we should, I think we should do like some sort of series of like questions only Jerry will ask you, and one of which, <laughs> you ever you ever heat treat cast bullets? No, no, Jerry, I haven't done that actually. You ever shoot fish underwater with a forty-five seventy? Out of an airboat? Uh, I can't say. I was pretty good either. on the deck. My little brother had he could he could drive the hell out that thing. I was the gunner. <laughs> All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.